Okay, everyone, we are getting ready to start our first panel of the day. Um, and it is on branding. Branding, very important. That is a word we're hearing uh, an awful lot over the past few years with you know, the explosion of social media and things like that. We have a fantastic panel in that regard. Um, and panel, as we saw yesterday, as we were discussing, there's some folks here not taking advantage of the situation, but there are some who absolutely are. Um, and so hopefully we'll get some more. But those of you who are here, thank you for taking the time because you will get something out of this. So um, let's introduce the panel. And then once we get to complete, you guys, because you have some fancy titles, can kind of explain what you do before we get going. Um, but first off, my colleague in NFL Network, Bucky Brooks, former NFL player, NFL scout. He's doing a lot of the player analysis here at the HBCU Legacy Bowl. Um, and he'll, we'll, he will be part of the broadcast when we do the game um, on Saturday. All right, next we have Stephen Brown, who's the VP of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Molson Coors. All right, and we have Valerie Love, who is the Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion at Coca-Cola. And to her right is Captain Adrian West, Chief of Staff, Force Readiness Command at the U.S. Coast Guard. And to his right, Greg Coleman, former punter for Florida A&M, the Minnesota Vikings, and member of the Black College Football Hall of Fame. I don't know how you're going to explain your title. I just kind of ran it down <laughs> for you, Greg. But, um, so, Buck, you know, why don't you just kind of let – and everyone will pass the mic down. Just let everyone know exactly what, what you do and how that can, again, lead into the whole branding aspect of what we're going to talk about. Okay, so I am what is considered a broadcast journalist. I write podcasts. I work on TV. I do everything, all mediums, talking all things football. So my entire existence when it comes to the workplace is about breaking down the game and talking about various aspects of the game. And so being able to take my experiences as a player and a former front office executive, parlaying that into a media career, that all took place by just basically building a brand and establishing myself as an expert or someone who has expertise in that area. Um, again, my name is Stephen Brown. I serve as the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion um, for Molson Coors. And, and part of my role is very simple um, in some ways is changing the culture. Um, and, and that's the conversation that we continue to have within the organization where every person, no matter your, your background, can come in and thrive in our organization, which really means that we have to change our processes and we have to change our practices. Um, we have to undo, unwire a lot of things that are happening um, while at the same time knowing that they're still happening outside of our, of our walls. Um, and so it's really kind of creating that, that environment. Good morning. My name is Valerie Love. I serve as a Senior Vice President of Human Resources for the North America Organization of Coca-Cola. And as part of my role, I support our diversity and inclusion and equity efforts. The most exciting part of my role is helping to structure the organization, look for different capabilities, and really grow the brand of the Coca-Cola company. So I'm really excited to be here with you, especially at this critical time to talk about branding. Good morning, all. Captain Adrian West, United States Coast Guard. I'm currently the Chief of Staff at uh, Force Readiness Command. And uh, what we do at Force Readiness Command is all the training and education that goes forth by the new entrants and those who have been around in, in the organization for a while. All the certifications, qualifications come through the Force Readiness Command. Uh, where branding becomes important there is that, you know, we're a military service. And so when you represent the nation, you would like for the nation or you would like for the, the service to mirror the nation that it serves. And so to, to have uh, to, to have your brand uh, represent that of the nation uh, helps us when it's time to engage with, with the public that we serve. Uh, I personally uh, have enjoyed being in the Coast Guard for more than 30 years now. Uh, came in on a minority scholarship and uh, just hoping to, to continue to bring folks in and add them to our numbers and again, have the Coast Guard one day mirror the, the country that we serve. I am Greg Coleman, uh, former NFL player, uh, first African-American punter in the National Football League. Uh, I've had the privilege of wearing a number of different hats uh, as a player, as a C-level executive uh, for a major communications company for 25 years, 
spending 40 plus years, 44 years with the Minnesota Vikings organization. As I mentioned, as a player, part of their broadcast team for the last 21, a sideline analyst uh, who recently, as of uh, three weeks ago, the end of our season, uh, dropped the mic and will walk away from the sidelines and uh, created my own professional speaking business. So I'm also now wearing a hat of a CEO. And branding is, is critical. Uh, and, and I know we'll get to this, but don't get stuck on one particular style of branding because branding, like in football, you have to adjust, adapt, and execute a different game plan. So versatility is the key, but it's a pleasure to be here with you uh, with the Legacy Bowl, the Career Fair, uh, the Minnesota Vikings, still doing some work with them, for them, although I am retired from that organization. Uh, but it was a great relationship. It is a great relationship for 44 plus years. Uh, so I look forward to this conversation. I just love how you dropped retired twice. Like you're really looking forward. <laughs> In case it's not clear. <laughs> In case it's not clear. So could someone pass Valerie the microphone? And first off, apologies, Valerie, because you're, when you said your whole title, you gave like a whole beefsteak salad, and I just gave some lettuce when I read it, so <laughs> my apologies. But let's start this off, because we're talking about branding. And so this morning, as I'm going through Instagram, I see that Coke has unveiled a new brand. You can explain what that is, why now, and why even Tinker was something that's been so successful for generations. Yeah, thank you so much for that uh, question. And we truly are excited because launching Starlight, which is our new brand, it's a, um, an opportunity for inspiration, innovation, and infinite possibilities. We recognize that as a 135-year-old company that we have to continue to reimagine our products. We have our trademark Cokes and we have all the other brands we've brought on Fairlife, we've just uh, acquired Body Armor, we have to continue to evolve with the next generation of our consumers. We are a brand that's, the trademark stands for itself, but we can't continue to grow and evolve unless we now listen to the next generation, those of you in the audience, most of you in the audience, to start thinking about what is it to reimagine the taste of our be beverages, to bring a little spark to our beverages. And oh, by the way, at the same time, keeping the zero sugar for those that aspire to continue the healthy journey. So we think about all of our, our drinkers, our consumers, from birth to, to the grave when we think about our fair life, our dairy products, our juices. But I know I'm going on and on giving an extra bit, but the starlight really is about reimagining and innovating and getting in front of and keeping our brand relevant for future generations. Well, yeah, yeah Stephen, I would say, why don't you pick up on that? Yeah, what I love about that, that conversation, um, and we probably experience the same thing at most in cores, that unless your core brand is relevant and says something, then when you try to um, roll out and move forward, um, you know, that's gonna be really weak. So your core brand has to be there. So a Coca-Cola, most in cores, it has to be strong. And then the people will follow you as you have continued to say who you are and what you wanna expand on. You know, if I think about myself and what my brand is, is how you make a difference. And so ultimately, if that is how your brand is, then when you continue to move on, you have to live up to that one. Because you don't live up to it, then we're like, well, why do I want to continue to follow a Coca-Cola? Why do I want to continue to follow a Molson Coors? If what they said their brand was, they didn't really um, adhere to that one, then you lose that. You don't add on the co consumers that you want to do. Um, and so that's really important. I just want to make sure I add that as well. well. And, and I want to follow up with you, too. You're wearing a Miller uh, pullover. So... You know, and Valerie just talked about how them acquiring body armor and some right. other things. Just real quick, the branding when you have mergers and acquisitions yeah. on how you said you have to have that, like you said, that core brand to make everything still allow you to build out. Yeah. We confuse a lot of people. <laughs> so um, you probably know us in, in some cases with, in regards like Miller Brewing Company. Um, and then you probably know cores. Well, now we're called most in cores. And you're like, so what is that? <laughs> and what, what falls there? So in many ways, we have to educate individuals what that brand is, that we're bringing two iconic, actually three, Miller, Molson, and Coors th together, and what is that? And so you have to really make sure that you establish this brand. Again, I said you hit the marker saying, Coors Light, you know who we are. 
Miller Brewing Company, you know what that, that is. And so that becomes an introduction of who your, your, your brands are. And so the name is important, but those brands who are you identify yourself, which again, I, I think you apply yourself. How do people identify you and, as your brand? And then they will follow you. So I think it's important to highlight that as well. Okay, and, and Bucky, I, I want to come to you because you know when you introduce yourself, former player, former scout, an expert in your field, right? You guys have established brands. Coast Guard's got an established brand. Greg, you built up credibility all your years as a player and journalist for the Minnesota Vikings. But a lot of young people have no establishment, right? They don't have that footprint yet. So when you talk about building a brand from the ground up, what is the important part about it? Because a lot of people are like, well, let me be someone who gets a million Instagram likes by taking some gym workout shots or something like that. I mean, maybe that's the brand they want to build, but do you necessarily build it through your social media and your outreach first, or do you need to build credibility first to make that part work? Well, I think the first thing you have to do is you have to be authentic. Whatever you say your brand is going to be, you have to live that brand. And so I work with a lot of young people as a high school coach, and our brand is we're tough, hardworking, and competitive. So in everything that you see us doing and everything that you see me doing, something should show to you that I'm tough, I'm hardworking, and I'm competitive. And so you have to be consistent in your messaging, and you have to live it as if you're selling it. And so when we talk about Instagram and all those other things, it has to be a consistent display of the authentic values that you really believe in. Because if you're authentic, people can buy into who you are, and if they buy into who you are, then they can trust you. And the biggest thing that you can have in any business is a level of trust, a level of commitment, and a level of accountability. And so that's why authenticity is really important when it comes to building your brand. And, and Go ahead, Bella. I was just going to add to that. I love exactly what Bucky is saying. The one thing I would say is your brand will evolve, but always make sure your brand can represent you even if you're not in the room. What are the characteristics that people will speak in reference to you even when you're not around? That's your brand, where that never shifts, where your character is in question, your integrity is in question. It's so important, and so now that social media is at the forefront, you always have to remember how you're showing up in social media. That becomes permanent, and especially in corporate America and other industries and other parts of your work life, people will refer back to that and say, is there a conflict between what we're looking for in our organization versus what we're seeing and what others are seeing? Because your brand becomes a part of the brand of the company or the organization that you become a part of as well. That's important. Agent, I see you bobbing your head. Just real quick before you answer, we're not waiting till the end of this discussion to have a Q&A. If you've got a question, um, raise your hand. Jeremy here will get you the mic because we want you to stay engaged because someone's going to say something that's going to trigger a thought. So don't, don't hesitate to go ahead and, and join this conversation. Adrian? Thank you so much. So you mentioned that, that your brand is the thing that's talked about when you're not in the room. Uh, your, your reputation is that thing that people think that they know about you. It's what they've heard about you. Your brand is that thing that people come to know about you. That thing that, that represents you, like you mentioned, when, when you're not around. Um, your reputation will precede you, but your brand will sustain you. Uh, I, I've seen folks do great damage to their brand through social media. I've, saw, I've seen folks lose careers in the Coast Guard because uh, of a questionable post in Facebook or, or Instagram. And so when you talk about, uh, about your, your brand being a, a subset of the brand of the company that you're with, if, if it doesn't align or if it's diametrically opposed to it, you do damage above your own self. And so you, you become unemployable uh, in, in some instances. So, you know, I, I, I would say that you know, of, of course, uh, it was mentioned up here, you have to be authentic because, you know, who can, who can act and be something that they're not, unless you're an actor, uh, for a number of years before uh, it's discovered that you are not what your brand represents, that it is. I like that you spoke about the evolution of your brand. And, you know, I remember, you know, drinking Coke since I was a kid and, the, you know, the, the, the flavors I'm familiar with. Change is tough for me. So we'll see what happens with that. <laughs> and, and, and good luck with it. We'll, yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, but it has to evolve. It's the reason why the Coast Guard is now looking at uh, diversity and inclusion initiatives because unintentionally the Coast Guard had become known as a primarily white organization 
uh, that was involved in missions that really didn't include a lot of diversity. It was found not to be true, and you know I, I'm proof of that. However, that's not the story that's told. And so the Coast Guard is trying to evolve and show that there are people of color, there are people of different gender and lifestyles that are doing the Coast Guard missions. And so we are collectively uh, putting our heads together and trying to strengthen the Coast Guard brand so that you know when you see a blue shirt worn by me or a woman or uh, you know whomever, uh, that it represents the same core values of honor, respect, and devotion to duty. But if my life in personal walk doesn't reflect honor, respect, and devotion to duty, at the core, then it's hard to, to, to sell that. It's hard to represent that and, and get the public to trust what it is we're trying to do. Uh, we were having a conversation uh, in the back where I'd mentioned that amongst African American captains in the Coast Guard, there are only 61. There have only been 61 lifetime in the Coast Guard, 232 years, if I'm doing my math correctly. 61, I'm number 35. Um, Branding became important there because not everyone gets to elevate to the level that I'm currently at. Branding could have hurt me uh, in my endeavor to get as far as I've gotten. Branding could have hurt the Coast Guard in that we would lack the representation at my level if, if my brand had somehow tarnished the Coast Guard brand, and they had to, to, you know, to separate themselves from me. So again, when you're establishing your brand, just understand that you know, there are unintended consequences to that thing that you think is real cool. In the moment, it might seem like that's the right thing to do. But I hope you have you know, a group of people that can kind of look at what you're trying to do and give you some input on it. And I hope that you would be willing to take that input and that advice and you know, either go forward or not go forward based on that advice. So keep good people in your circle. And, and Greg, I, you know, to, to kind of pick up on that a little bit, okay, you and I, Buck, we kind of do the same thing. We're front facing, we're in front of the camera, we speak to people in the public. You establish your credibility as one of the best punters in the NFL for more than a decade. But as a broadcaster, you establish things with your authenticity, um, the way you treat people. But to follow up Adrian's point, as a black person in the media, and there are not many of us, the pressure to not screw it up for everyone else who wants to do what we want to do. So we talk about branding and authenticity, but for us it's a little bit different as to where we can't step on that balloon and have it pop too loudly like others can. Why would you throw me down that rabbit hole? <laughs> because, Greg, I know but you. And you're good at this. But, but, but to your point, you're absolutely right, and I will answer that. But let me go back while this is on my, on my head. You, there was a point that was made, or beginning of a conversation, about young people. How do you establish your brand just getting, getting out of college? You don't have the experience of uh, being in whatever area, a career pattern that you would like. You start building your brand with what's passionate with you. What's important to you? And then you build off of that. You know, we're gonna talk a whole lot of sports analogies. You, in life, you will know and come to understand and realize that you have to adjust, adapt, and execute to a different game plan. But that core you, that core person, has to be the same, and then you build on that through adjustments, adapting a different game plan, because I had the privilege of talking to most of our young people over the last number of years. When I say young people, our players. One thing that I know about all players, one characteristic that they all have is that they are a leader in some way, shape, or form. Because if you didn't have that leadership characteristic, you would not survive in the National Football League. So they have that, all they have that in common. Companies are looking for leaders. They're looking for leadership. They're looking for people who are adaptable, who can make a, a change on the fly. You make a, an adjustment, 
halftime adjustments. You heard that, you hear that all the time, and you'll hear Bucky and, and Steve talk about that tomorrow during the game, the adjustments that coaches have to make. Well, there are adjustments that you will have to make as young people. Captain talked about surrounding yourselves with people who can, no one can ever tell you what to do, but they can make suggestions. And I never tell anybody what to do, but I always ask, is that the wise decision for this moment in time? Is that the wise decision? Because I use, use the, 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 the adjective wise versus, man, just do the right thing. Now, how many times have we heard that? But if you ask, is that wise, you invoke wisdom into that conversation. You will invoke wisdom. There's a difference between right and wrong and wisdom. So you have to have someone, and a mentor is not necessarily someone who is older than you. There's someone who has wisdom, who has been through the battle. And who, someone who does not want you to fall in the same pothole that they fell in many, many years ago. And then it's up to you to make that adjustment. The Minnesota Vikings, many, many years ago, we had a mascot. The first mascot, his name was Hub Mead. He walked around with a big sword, with the beard and the horns. But as time progressed, we had to adjust, we went to another mascot. Ragnar, with a beard, didn't wear the horns, but he rode around on a motorcycle. He was relatable. Then we had to make another adjustment for you millennials. And now all of the mascots across the NFL, most of them have these big costume wearing mascots because they related to young people and the kids. Because if a kid, hey dad, I, I, want, I want this mascot. If enough of them say it, nine times out of 10, the parents are gonna adjust and, and it's, it's about the dollar, okay? Uh, and, and one last thing, back to Steve's question. Yes, we know that we all are on the shoulders of somebody else. And it's, it's men like you and Bucky and, and James Brown, the guys are household names. Nate Burleson, I remember when Nate started his brand with the Minnesota Vikings many, many years ago as a player, doing little things for the Vikings. He did not come into the league or leave the league with aspirations of being on CBS, but he just wanted to take another step but he kept working, he kept training, he kept adjusting, but his core brand stood the test of time. When Michael Strahan went to ABC News, most people say, man, that, that'll never happen again. He's one in a million. Well, Michael opened the door as a pioneer athlete, going from sports to news. Nate Burleson has followed his footsteps and has even taken that to another level now on broadcasting games on Nickelodeon. I'm saying, who in the ham fat watches Nickelodeon? Kids. That's Milli dollars. Millions, millions of, kids of kids and their parents. So again, being able to adjust, adapt, and execute to a, game, a different game plan, but also keeping your core values intact. And I'll say this and I'll give the mic. I didn't make it my first year. I got cut after I was drafted by the Cincinnati Bengals. I went back home and I taught school because I graduated from Florida a and with my degree. And I found out at a very early age that the NFL is a multi-billion dollar business. And I had to treat it as such. So I prepared with every game in every season like it was my last game and my last season. So what did I do in terms of preparation? I created a business card. With my name and phone number, we didn't have emails and Twitter and you know, IG and all of those things. We didn't have emails back then. Damn, did I just say that? I'm we didn't have the internet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we did not have the internet. But you're going to get an opportunity to meet someone who can make a difference in your career 
whether it's in a setting like this or for 30 seconds on an elevator, you got to be able to say in 30 seconds or less who you are and what do you do and why should I be, even be interested in you. Who you are, what do you do, and what do you bring to the table? But yes, yeah, Steve, uh, the pressure that you guys are under now, since I am from under that microscope. Oh, since you retired? Bro- <laughs> you're <gonna say laughs> since I retired. Go ahead and say, <laughs> hey, Steve, I jump in. Um, I, I love what you just said, because it just sounds very simple. Um, you know, we talked about your, your brand is something that um, talks about you when you're not in the room. Very simple, and you know, most of my career has been a, as an HR um, leader. And I would say to your brand sometimes, even when you introduce your resume, this sounds silly. But there's some email addresses that you would have, Hot Mama 101. Uh-oh. And I'm like, hmm? <laughs> like, like, really? That's your email that you're using for your business? Just small things like that in regards to how do you want to present yourself really easy? And by the way, I didn't just make that up. There's some crazy emails out there. And, I'm, and all of a sudden, even before I even look down in your credentials, I've always kind of created a story about you that you probably don't want me to create. So just really being mindful about just something like that. The other one that I would say is, and again, I think this is also simple too about your brand, how you can establish it early, is something called your say-do ratio. Your say-do ratio. Your say-do ratio should always be one plus. So if you say something, you do it. That should be one to one. I think sometime when we evaluate is mine's like 0.5, it's like I will say something, I don't follow up. That becomes your brand. So just a very simple way. You don't have to have a whole lot of credentials. You don't have to have a whole, I mean, you're not here yet, but how you get here is your say do. So if there's nothing else you can take away from today is just ask yourself when you are in the privacy of your room, how frequently is my say do closer to one than a zero? And the closer to one is you have built the brand. If it's closer to zero, you need to rebuild your brand <laughs> as quickly as possible. Well, to that point, the folks who are here building their brand because any employer here is going to be like, they're here and there's a whole lot of people who haven't, who are not here. So I want to speak to these folks because they're taking the time to share that, you know, share their time and experience today. So Valerie, you know, I want to follow up with you as an, you know, as someone who looks for talent acquisition, brand building, things like that, what do you look for when you get resumes or you meet people for the 30 seconds in that elevator that get your attention and make you dig deeper? Very good question. So beyond the capability skills that we look for with talent coming especially out of university of some of the foundational uh, learnings that they've had, we want integrity. We want talent that really wants to do what's right. And integrity is a big piece of that. Also, teamwork, collaboration, the ability to be bold in your thinking, innovative, thinking outside of the box. We love creativity, and this next generation blows our mind. When they come into the organization, we know that we either create the space for them to be creative, for them to think outside of the box, or they're going to go other places. We have to think beyond the traditional career path that we've had for so many years. I'm not quite before the internet period, but I'm I'm tenured in my career that I have to think beyond what I grew up with and what my, my career progression has been. So talent that's willing to explore different things, talent that thinks beyond the space that they studied in in university. You may have studied in marketing and find yourself in online uh, roles because that's where the future is. It's on online capability, it's on digital analytics. When you have that learning agility and we sense it and see it in your early tenure, we'll start to move you around because that's, that creates enterprise leaders. And we're looking for enterprise leaders in the organization that can quickly pivot where the, where the industry is going, where the generation is going, where the work is going. So we're having to reinvent ourselves. So just coming in with a passion to learn, an eagerness to get in and do the work. I've, my career, if I could quickly share, is I started as a financial analyst. So my background is budgets and accounting. Scott, who's from Coke, is probably looking at me like, what? You're HR now. But I started in finance. I quickly realized my passion was for people. So when I was asked to take a leadership development opportunity and go into operations, 
I took it. Most of my, my peer group were saying, you gotta be kidding, you're going from the corporate office into a manufacturing plant, or oh, by the way, in a United Auto Workers Union environment, which I was at General Motors when I first started my career. I said yes. The power of yes can change the trajectory of your life. Had I not taken that opportunity, I'd probably be still doing month ends and bean counting. But it took me into a place where I knew my passion was with people. So from operations, working on the supporting, supervising the assembly line, I got to know the insights of people and what motivated them to do better and to improve. It took me into labor relations, and now I'm in my sweet spot of where I truly feel like I can impact change in the HR space. So I say all of that to say, when you start your career, believe it can evolve, it can change. You continue to grow, you learn, and you may take some shifts and pivots. Be open to that, the power of yes. And, and Bucky, I want you to follow up on that. You, oh, I'll hand you, the, okay. So, but, but you, you talked about going from, you know, collegiate football player and track star to NFL player to scouting department to now media, the adjustment, the evolution. I mean, what did you have to go through to kind of say, okay, I want to do this and I want to do that. Well, let me try this. Okay, I'm pretty good at this. Now I'm, now my brand is built up as that. Uh, it's really an interesting journey. Um, and there are a lot of things that I would like to say. So going from being a player, I would say my career in the National Football League was one that was pretty nondescript. I was a backup player, a special teams player, not a star. Um, during my time as a player, I decided that I wanted to be a scout. So while I was still playing, I made it known that I would love to join a part of a front office. So I would have conversations with those in the building to let them know that I had a desire to be a scout. My entrance into the scouting world was when I went to the Green Bay Packers for a workout, the guy who picked me up from the airport is John Snyder. John Snyder is now the general manager for the Seattle Seahawks. But at the time, he was a lowly, entry-level worker. But from our conversations on a ride from the airport to the stadium, we began to develop a relationship. The first opportunity that I had as a scout, I called John to get background information for an interview. He said, don't go anywhere. I may have an opportunity in Seattle. If I get that, I'll bring you in. And so my first job as a front office exec came from a relationship where I didn't have to interview, but because we had a conversation in cars and we developed a friendship, I was able to go on. In terms of going into the media, um, I would say when we talk about building a brand, one of the best things that all of us can do is really master the art of communication, and I would say writing. By writing, you have an opportunity to set yourself up as an expert in whatever field that it is. And so by being able to write, it then opens doors for you to leverage your expertise into more opportunities. When you think about now the way the world is wide open, from the blogosphere to being able to use Twitter to being able to now send out emailable newsletters, you have a unique opportunity as a young person to position yourself as an expert in a field that is one that is a passion. And so when we think about the media and the media career and being able to make it to that step, it is not only working hard at your craft, but it's soliciting the help of mentors that can help you along the way. Steve Weish has been a mentor of mine from the jump. Jim Trotter and others helped me along the way. But I would be remiss if I didn't use my scouting experience to kind of tell you what, as a scout, we always look for in players. And a lot of a lot of it is not about what you do on the field. There were five things that we always talked about that we wanted and people that we brought into our teams. First one was intelligence. You need smart people in your building because it elevates the IQ of the entire program. And so when you bring in smart people, people who can think on their own, people who are self-driven, it elevates the performance of the team. The second part is we wanted leadership. We wanted leaders, people who had demonstrated leadership ability in a team setting, we wanted team captains because it is easier to build a winning program when you have a team full of people who have led because leaders know how to follow. Third, we wanted competitive people, people who were high achievers, people who have given a task, they wanted to be A plus at that task. So when we think about GPAs and performance and all those things, people who absolutely crushed it, 
Because if they're driven to succeed in anything, they'll make sure they do that in everything that they do. The final part of it was we wanted grit, toughness. People who had gone through hard stuff but didn't fail. All of us could probably talk about some of the challenges that we had to encounter to make it where we were. There's some level of adversity that you must scale and overcome. As a player, I was cut five different times. Five times I was told no, but you get up the sixth time and go in. So do you have that resiliency inside of you to respond? And then the final part of when you have your opportunity, you have to perform. Like, make no mistake about it. Everyone up here, when given the opportunity, you have to perform. And so it has to be important for you to be ready for your chance. And when your chance is given, you have to crush it. And you can't have excuses for why it doesn't work. And so it's a bottom line business in everything that you do. And so you have to understand that performance matters. Those are the things that you must be equipped with to succeed. Well said, Bucky. And I mean, I well said. Hey, man. I really oh, yeah, I mean, that was. And no, wonder, and no wonder why the Packers and Seahawks are usually really good because of the philosophies. But look, I mean, to his last point, you're here, right? You're seizing an opportunity. So you take the knowledge that you gain from here and perform, which is why I'm hoping you guys start asking some questions of this panel because we have some experts here. But I do want to get to Adrian and, and, and on this branding issue. So most people here know about the Marine Corps in the Army, in the Air Force, in the Navy. But the Coast Guard? I mean, I'm not trying to offend, but a lot of people may say, okay, we've seen videos of them rescuing, you know, somebody stranded at sea or trying to intercept a boat of narcotics, you know, coming up off the coast of Florida. So branding the Coast Guard, what is it? What is it when you try to recruit, especially people of color, as to why they should join the Coast Guard and be someone like you who's been in it for more than 30 years. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take a run at this. So I'm, I'm sure the people of New Orleans know who the Coast Guard is, uh, having come through the tragedy of Hurricane Katrina. So we were probably never, uh, and, and the former commandant Thad Allen would say, we were never more, more visible or relevant during that hour. Since then, um, well, the short answer is we don't have the commercials, we don't have the, we don't have the uh, the budget to go big on on commercials or advertising or you know, and then we we might eke out a movie, like every eight, ten years, it'll be about a rescue swimmer, or it'll be about us battling a giant squid, <laughs> or it'll be about us being overrun by pirates, or it'll be like a bit part uh, in a TV show with. David Hasselhoff running next to the, next to the helicopter. Um, I would tell you that we're, we would like to say that we're too busy doing to talk about the work. But I was just talking to the recruiters back there in the back, Chief, uh, is that we've always done ourselves a disservice when it comes to promoting ourselves and, and saying what we do. We are so proud of the work we do that we forget to ask for help in doing the job. Um, Inside the wire of the Coast Guard, I don't think it's conscious that we don't, that, that we present as a homogenous service, that everyone basically looks the same. Um, I don't think it was a conscious effort on behalf of the Coast Guard to say that we want all our Coasties to look like this and sound like this and walk and talk and act like this. I think it just kind of happened that way because we forgot to ask the divergent opinion. What would make someone want to join the United States Coast Guard? Well, we're a life-saving service. We're a humanitarian service. Uh, we're war fighters when we have to be. We've been involved in every war that this, that this country has been involved in. At one point, we were the only Navy that, the, that, that America had. Uh, the United States Navy, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll mess up the year so I won't even try, but for a five-year stretch, the United States Navy was, was not active. And so the Revenue Cutter Service became the United States Navy for that period and covered down. So we are war fighters when we have to be, but, but largely a humanitarian service. Uh, where do we recruit from? Uh, all corners, but 
when you can't get your brand to the corners where you mean to uh, recruit from, that becomes a challenge. I'm one of 61 lifetime African American captains and one of 19 currently on the roster right now. I can't be everywhere. Uh, so it's tough to get in those rooms and say, hey, we need people who look like me, who look like us, who walk, talk, act like us to get in with our ideas and, uh, you know, get it to a point where I no longer am, am the anomaly. When I, when, I, when I met you backstage and I told you, I feel like I, I, feel like I know you because I see you so often on my television screen. I grew up with O.J. Simpson as a as an analyst, and Jane Kennedy, have mercy. Uh, come back, come back. <laughs> sorry. Be careful that branding. But, Be careful that branding. Well, but, <laughs> but you all have taken it to a point where it doesn't look strange anymore. You know, the league has gone to a point where it doesn't look strange to see African Americans in every position. Um, Except. Okay. Yes, thank you. Right on. So They're two and a half, Greg. They're two and a half. So we would like to get the Coast Guard to a point where it doesn't look strange to see someone who looks different than the norm or what the, what the established and recognized norm came to be uh, doing the Coast Guard missions. So again, why join? I, I can't tell you uh, why personally you should align yourself with the humanitarian service. I did because I just have a heart for it. Uh, you know, I was brought up to, to you know, to do the right thing. I know, I know that <laughs> contextually it matched at the time when my grandmother was telling me that you, know, you can do whatever you want to do, just make sure that what you do is contributive and doesn't take away from the thing that's trying to be done. So uh, I, never entertained, uh, I never entertained failure, um, but I always wanted to be of help. Uh, the people that I was drawn to in my younger years were all heroes. And what do heroes do? They save lives, mostly. That's what I watched on television. That's what Superman did. That's what Batman did. That's what, you know, that's what all the heroes did. And so I can get paid to do that? No, I am by no means a superhero. I used to be to my kids, no longer. Uh, but, you know, this is the closest I'll get to it, and this works for me. Now, whatever works for you, please bring your talents to wherever you think they can be best utilized. But don't forget about yourself in the process because there has to be some personal growth in that as well. If I felt like I could not be, uh, be nurtured and, and brought forward in the United States Coast Guard, I would have taken my talents somewhere else. Uh, I, wasn't, I was undaunted by the fact that the numbers were, were few in my favor. I was told, hey, if it hasn't been done yet, then I guess that we were just waiting for you to do it. That, that, that's a heck of a message. So, yeah. so, Greg, real quick. And then we do have a question. Okay. Um, all of you have something. But how do we know it? How do you present it? You have to present it, and I think earlier, one of my earlier comments was with passion. Whatever, you, what, whatever is passionate to you, bring it but bring it with confidence and not cockiness. Nobody can sell you better than you. Mama used to say, there's a sorry dog that won't wag its own tail. But you do it with confidence and not arrogance because that leadership piece is about confidence. It's about confidence. It's about knowing who you are and knowing what you bring to the table, whatever you bring to the table, whatever your tagline is. You know, I thought about this at a very early age. Um, I knew that I was not going to punt forever. So the tagline that I took from punting was, hey, what do you do best? Man, I flip the field. I flip the field and I give people a leg up on life. Leg up, flip the field. You know, that whole kicking philosophy, that whole kicking psyche, a play on words. You, be creative. When you go and talk to these businesses, why should they select you over somebody else? Why are you different? How are you going to make that company, that organization, that business better? 
If you serve a particular person or a particular business with all of your heart, all of your might, and all of your passion, whenever you launch, you're going to expect the very same thing, that somebody serves you with all of their might, all of their hope, and all of their passion. So whenever you get that opportunity, man, bust your hump. Do the best you can. Be the best. You know, my high school had a, a saying, Ichiban. And in Japanese, that means number one. We were always striving to be number one. We were always striving to be the best. So whatever you do, be the best at it. If you're going to be a, a punter, be the best during punter. Because people looked at punters and kickers as the low man on the totem pole, but they were the most important people on that field on fourth downs. So know it and own your damn fourth down. Own it like nobody's business. And before you know it, people say, well, man, how did you last for, for, for 12 years? And how did you last with an organization for 44 years? Because I own what I did. And it wasn't with arrogance. It was with confidence and passion. I was a passionate player. I was a passionate broadcaster. And sometimes I had to really dial that back a little bit. Because once the salt is out of the shaker, you can't take it back. Social media, once you hit sin, you can't take it back. Bucky knows in our organization, we look at social media from sometimes with athletes from eighth grade watching your character. So while we, you're watching us, we're watching you as well. Steve, you had a question? Somebody? I think you're going to be a passionate retiree too, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> I already have a question back here. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you guys for coming here and giving me the chance to talk to us. Uh, my name is Keon Russell. I go to Gremlin State University. And I just had one question for pretty much anyone who cares to answer. Uh, what advice would you give to your younger self at the start of your career and maybe anyone can kind of tell us about what are some of the trials and tribulations you guys went through to get to where you are today? That's a very good question. I'll start. I will say um, silence the naysayers. And sometimes the naysayer is you. Getting in your own way of saying, I can't do this. I can't possibly be the next whomever. Believe in yourself. Always bring your authentic self to the table, who you truly are. And also, do the work. Do the work, be willing to roll up your sleeves, do what's necessary to grow and develop. And the one thing that I've learned over time is relationships. Relationships are so important, and the relationships can be those that are in roles that you aspire to, but sometimes it's the people that are your peer group and the ones that you think are in roles that you've already aspired beyond. Every person that you connect with could be that next opportunity to move forward. So build relationships, network with intention, and be very intentional about how you progress, whatever it is you want to do. But do what you're passionate about as well. Yeah, let me, um, I, I'm not sure even how I can add onto that. Let me, um, but let me say this. Um, I say this often, that statistically, I, I don't supposed to be here. Um, and some of that was because I told myself that, and others because other people told me that. Stay in your lane, understand your place, you're not good enough, you're not strong enough, you're not the smartest one in the room. And um, I was actually, and what, and what they, what they actually helped me do is to figure, see myself in a di different place. To your point, get out of my, my, my own head. So the younger me is, get in your head and get out of it. Like, get in there and kind of think about what you're doing, what you're saying, how you position yourself. I have to talk, I, I have a lot of voices in my head, which is a little scary, but I really do. I talk to myself a lot. Yesterday, I think someone mentioned about writing down the dreams. Um, and I didn't even know how big a dream I could have. So sometimes when you write down the first dream, you recognize your dreams that can get a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. I rarely get, be, I'm really envious of someone. I take notes a lot. If he or she, they can do it, can I do a little bit of that? 
even when someone said no, why don't you tell yourself yes? I, and, I, and I do think that in my younger years, I had to actually talk myself out of saying, what well, you haven't done it before. There was no blueprint. My mother had me at 19 years old. My father was too cool to be a father. And so for me, I didn't have that blueprint. And I'm like, well, damn, why don't I just create my own blueprint? <laughs> and that was actually okay with me. So my younger self is, it's actually okay to create your own blueprint. Let me tag on to that a little bit, writing down goals. Uh, when I was uh, a short in high school, I wrote, you know, in your high school yearbooks, what do you want to be, what's your ambition, what's your favorite color? And I said I wanted to be a kicking specialist in the National Football League. And everybody who saw that, uh, my teammates, my classmates, they laughed. They said, man, you must be out of your mind. There ain't no black punters and kickers in the National Football League. And I said, that ain't my problem. That is not my problem. You have to create. When preparation meets opportunity, nine times out of 10, that's gonna equal success. So you gotta prepare for whatever it is. You gotta write it down. Man, dare to dream. You've heard all of these things. And I dreamed about being a punter in the National Football League over and over and over again. Over and over and over again until I got that opportunity. And when I got that opportunity, I was prepared enough to make a lifelong dream as a shorty, it came to reality. So write it down, read it, swallow it, believe in it, and do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes to achieve that goal, but do it with integrity and do it with above the law because what's done in the dark will certainly come to the light. Let me ask something. Um, I would advise you to, with your mindset, approach everything with an earn everything attitude. A lot of times we sit around and we say, man, I want someone to give me a scholarship or I wish someone would give me the opportunity. I think if you take the earn everything approach, then you take all of that off the table and you're willing to earn whatever it is that you want down the road. The second part of it, I would say, approach life as a blue chip talent with a blue collar mentality. So what we want is you to be an elite performer who works at an elite level. When you think about the greats that we always admire, Kobe Bryant's and Michael Jordan's, those guys were elite talents, but their work ethics was legendary. So what you always want to do is you want to be the highest performer in the room, but you also want to say that you outworked everybody in the room. Because if you commit yourself to really working hard and being diligent and deliberate in your practice, the performance will ultimately come. But you have to take all of the excuses off the table and you have to be committed to being the best in the room by performing well, but also outworking everybody. Because the talent alone won't get you there. You have to be someone that people point to as the hardest worker in the room. Those are the ones that go from good to great. And Adrian, before you jump in, if I can just piggyback off what Bucky said, because that's, as a young person, to me, that is the number one thing. I have vouched for people to get them in jobs that they wanted by putting my reputation at stake. And there's one person in particular who shirked his responsibility. He came out posing, yeah, I work at the NFL Network, this and that, but he didn't do the work. So when his ass got let go, who did that make look bad? me okay so someone you can earn everything you want but someone is going to take a risk on you to employ you so if you don't outwork everyone you're going to make them look bad the greatest compliment ever paid to me was by a legendary sports editor i used to work for at the washington post named george solomon who said i am so glad i hired you because you make me look good Greatest compliment, he was patting himself on the back, but I took that in a way like, I'm glad I made him look good because he took a chance on me. And just also because we're at a career fair with an acronym that represents HBC, the acronym HBCU, black colleges, when you go to wherever you work, it's not gonna look like your campus. You're gonna be one of few, regardless of where you work. Okay, as a person of color, you're gonna be one of few. 
So you do also, with that work ethic, have to take the mentality. My first job I got in Richmond, Virginia, I was told I was a minority hire. I said, that's great. I'm going to make sure that you never, ever say that to anybody again because I'm going to do so well that the next person that comes from Virginia Union or Howard or Hampton or wherever, you don't have to say you're a minority hire. Like, we like you. You're, 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 you've earned the right to work for. So take that approach. I'm going to make it better for the next person behind me. I mean, we're, we're wise and have wisdom up on the stage, right? So our job is to be here to uplift and to make things easier for everybody else behind us. But take that approach from the jump, and you'll realize your career path will probably accelerate a little bit faster than other people who are just looking at themselves. Adrian, I know, I know you wanted to say something. I cut you. No, I, I was just, you know, it, it would just be piling on at this point. But, you know, just you know, something that happened to me as a kid to just support the point was that uh, when I was in, in high school, I was on the football team. I was a receiver. All five, eight of me uh, wide receiver. And we were running routes, and I ran this route, and I completely messed up the play, the entire play. And the coach came unhinged. And he said, Wes, you completely effed up that play. He said, and the only reason you are still on my team is because you effed it up at 100 miles per hour. <laughs> he said, so that told me that you thought you were doing the right thing. And if I can turn that tenacity into something positive, we got ourselves a football player. So I will take that L, but only that L. But it was the work ethic that went into it that, that saved me that day and that sustained me throughout. So my younger self, just go hard. Do it 100 miles an hour. Great. And we've got, we've got two questions coming up, and we'll have one, one person answer each question, and then we've got to button things up here because we're on the clock. Good morning. My name is Stefan Savage. I'm a student athlete from Alcorn State University. My question is for you, Mr. Brooks. I heard that you said you were cut five times, and when you have a passion for a sport like that and you work so hard to do it, what made you finally decide to take another career path after that? It's funny. Um, Great question. One, when you cut five times and you face that kind of disappointment, I was lucky that I had a dad who probably is the most confident man that I've ever been around. And in talking to him, he said, you can't be made of steel until you try by fire. And so you have to go through some stuff to learn how to overcome some stuff. And so in looking back at that, I would say now those failures enabled me to now be more emboldened when I face a failure that I can make it through. And so I would say that any setbacks that you encounter as a player or anything, all that's going to do is give you more confidence that in the next endeavor that you face, that you will find a way. Because the first time you fail, it's devastating. The next time, not so much if you continue to go on. And so what you want to do is, there's a saying that I talk to my football team, there are no losses, they're just lessons. And so every time you fail, it's an opportunity for you to learn to be better the next time. And so I took the failure as a player and put it into, let me pour it into evaluating guys in writing. And so when I started as a writer, I was undaunted by the failures that I may encounter. When I was told multiple times, no, you can't do TV, you can't do this, you can't do that, it didn't bother me because those earlier failures gave me confidence that I would figure it out in the end. Great. And then we have a question right here. Thank you. Hi, guys. My name is Tony Hall. I'm currently employed with the NFL. And there's so much wisdom on this stage. Just listening to you guys pour out into our lives is extremely inspiring. So my question to you, you guys have all had tailor-made journeys specifically for you. What have you learned most about yourself within the journey of life? More than one person can answer that one. <laughs> I, I'm going to keep it really simple. Um, I belong. Um, there wasn't a lot of examples growing up where I saw people like me on these stages. Um, and my belief was I belong. And when you know that you belong, even when people tell you you don't supposed to be there, you know that you have a place there. So it's just a real simple way. I belong. I like that one a lot. 
But I also have learned that I can do hard things. Even if it's hard, I know if I put everything into it, I go at 100 miles an hour and I just push through, I can do hard things. So no matter what the, the challenge or opportunity is, being the first isn't what inspires me. It's making sure I'm not the last that looks like me. I want to create the space because I know I stand on the shoulders of so many that have done the, the groundwork, that were the... Girl. <laughs> <laughs> I think we are the, now in church. Yeah. <laughs> Again. I'll pass the basket <laughs> shortly. But the foot soldiers, the ones that are still doing the work because we believe in the generations that are come after us, I have a sense of responsibility. It's not a burden. But I want to make sure I'm opening the door wide enough that so many more can come in that look like me, that to the point that was made, the odds weren't in my favor. But now that the door is open, it's my responsibility to make sure the narrative changes. I can do hard things. I'll add just a little bit of that since we're in church. I can do all things. I can do all things. Hey. In, in, in the reason that words are so critical and words are so important, we all can remember words of encouragement when we were shorties. We can remember those words that were not so flattering. I heard things from my high school coach, from my college coaches at, at Florida a and some of my instructors at Florida a and heard them say that I could do and I could be and I was stupid enough to believe them. I was stupid enough to believe in the words that they said that I could be. We've, we've, we've heard this term about be the best. Let me share this with you and this is my last comment. This so the poem that was, that was inspired by a former teammate of mine, Gerald Irons, who was a, a linebacker for the Cleveland Browns. He was one of my mentors. He said, Coleman, I've watched you handle all of this mess. He said, brother, you are the best. To be the best is my quest. Athletes come and athletes go, but there's something very special about being a pro. So on and on towards this goal I'll strive while keeping my championship hopes alive. And let us not forget the day-to-day -day concentration for it'll help make us the best in the nation. To be the best is my quest. Now some might just be happy to make the Viking squad, but I'll never be satisfied until I get that Super Bowl wad and so much happiness I know it will bring. The thrill of wearing a Super Bowl ring to be the best is my quest. Everything needed I cannot mention, but I hope the things that I've said is not beyond your retention. So whatever you do, be the best. Whoa. Without a teleprompter. You bad. You are bad man. So last thing when it comes to branding, and, and I think this is very important for everybody here. Like I mentioned the acronym. What are the four letters before this legacy? Well, HBCU. As, and Valerie, I do want to start with you, Valerie. Again, as someone who employs, who seeks talent, who tries to make sure equitable talent is throughout your organization, you're here, right? Employers looking to HBCUs for talent. Why is that important? What are the expectations of you to deliver and the expectations of the people you speak with from HBCUs to be deliverable? I love that question. Oh, by the way, I'm a product of an HBCU, Tennessee State University. There you go, there you go, so, shout it out. Go TSU. So I will tell you the responsibility that I take on as part of corporate America is to make sure that we open the doors for students like me to come out of HBCUs to be considered for opportunities to make sure the students in those universities are as prepared as a non-HBCU student. I, I, I was a board member for the National Black MBA Association and so many times I would hear employers say, we can't find black talent. I'm blown away. They're still saying it. They're still saying it and it's still troubling for me to have companies say they can't find, where are you looking? Because I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, by the way, three HBCU, four HBCUs right there at our doorstep. So my responsibility now is to be a part of the, 
the galvanizing of the efforts to go into the universities, be a part of the career development centers, be a part of working with the faculty, helping with the curriculum to make sure we take away any excuses because a company that looks at diversity as a competitive advantage will win. We need to make sure our company's demographics mirror the populations that we serve. We know the largest consumers of our beverages are diverse individuals, Hispanic, African-American, black, Asian, yet we don't reflect that in our company's demographics. That's work for us. Our CEO, I met with our CEO and some of our leadership just last week to put together a task force to change that. Many of you may know, hopefully you don't, but you know now, that in 2000, the Coca-Cola companies was served the largest corporate lawsuit in U.S. history. That's a black, a negative flag on the company, and it remains in our history. It's our responsibility to change that and make sure the narrative is such that we never find ourselves in that place again. So my work will continue to make sure we recruit, hire, not just recruit, because we can bring talent to Coca-Cola. It's not hard to get talent, but how do we make sure we convert them, develop them, and retain them? So we've got a lot of work out in front of us, and I'm, I'm ready to do the work. I mentioned we can do hard things. And, and, well, Bucky, no, no, I, I want you here too, because you know, you're, you're calling a football game tomorrow. You and I are calling this game with Charles Davis and Cameron Wolf, but you're here to shine a light. You're a former scout, right? Last two years, only one player from an HBCU drafted to the NFL. You're here to help explain to your brethren, who you know, dozens of, this guy's worthy, that guy's worthy. But something we found out this week, that I think the majority of the players in this game have already graduated, mm -hmm. right? Like a quill glass of getting his master's in civil engineering. The importance of explaining that and showcasing the intelligence, which we talked about, as well as the grit and the other pillars you talked about. What does that mean to you as someone who didn't go to an HBCU but has forever tried to highlight the HBCU athlete and the person? Well, I'm a product of a two HBCU grads. My mom and dad both attended HBCU, Shaw University, and Fayetteville State University, respectively. And so my job is to make sure that we leave the place in a better spot. And so when it comes to looking at evaluating HBCU players, it's – not only talking about what they bring on the field, but how they've had to overcome because it may be a lack of resources, different environment, those things. It's no different than looking at other small school standouts. And finally, you talked about what is a really important part. There have been studies that have gone on to show that players who graduate with a college degree play in the NFL on average longer than those who don't. And so if we're talking about a number of HBCUs grads that are participating in this game. By graduating, they've elevated and enhanced their opportunity to play for a long time in the league. My job is to provide an outlet and a form to show everyone that they're talented guys who have an opportunity to play at the next level. Let's make sure we grant those guys an opportunity to play. Great. Well, we want to thank you for taking the time, for listening, for asking questions. Panel, you've been fabulous. And in case you didn't know, Greg Coleman is retired. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wait, but he wants the mic one more time. No, no, he's not. Go ahead, Greg. Go ahead, Greg. You talked about what that means, HBCU, the Legacy Bowl. I believe that I have the responsibility. What is that? That's for me? No, I want to grab your mic after you. Okay. The responsibility to continue a dream that was started by Doug Williams and, and James Shaq Harris to highlight the efforts of young African-American players from HBCU schools. We've resolved the issue of the black quarterback. There was a stigma that black men could not lead complicated offenses in the National Football League. That has been a misnomer that has been proven. Some have called me a pioneer, a trailblazer, by being the first full-time African-American punter in the National Football League. I don't like that term, that adjective that's been used. Because a pioneer and a trailblazer opens the doors for others. 
Yeah, there have been a few, but not enough. And I'm going to use this platform of the Black College Football Hall of Fame and the HBCU Legacy Bowl. We have created the Greg Coleman Golden Touch Award that's going to present an award to the top HBCU African-American punter. And I don't apologize for that. But also in support uh, from the Minnesota Vikings, we're going to make sure that this young man gets to camps that can refine his skills, can tighten up, get exposure to coaches and scouts, so that it just won't be one. Because there's a young man, Presley Harvin, who currently punting uh, for the Pittsburgh Steelers, Mike Tomlin, his, his head coach, Da, go figure that one out. But just to give another young man an opportunity, doing whatever we can, because I can remember my last year was in Washington with Doug, sitting in hot tubs and talking about the what ifs. The what ifs, it were dreams many, many years ago. And Doug and Shaq dared to dream about creating the Black College Football Hall of Fame. Now the Legacy Bowl that, hi that highlights HBCU colleges and institutions to see what Deion Sanders, Coach Prime, has done down at Jackson State, and now Eddie George at Tennessee State, Hugh Jackson over at Grambling, and other men who have migrated from the National Football League now to HBE, HBCU colleges and institutions. And we all have a responsibility to give back, to reach as we continue to climb. And that's why I'm here, and that's what I'll Steve, that is the next, one of the next chapters after retirement. So thank you all for being here. God bless you. That's a new brand. That's the Greg's new brand. Thank you, Greg. Steve, thank you. So um, we got up, and he, he's, he's uh, this is sort Kevin, of. This is Kevin Kaplan, by the way, people. Kevin, you'll see him walking around. He's not going to say much. He's the organizer of all of this. Okay, he is. He is, he is our, he's our keystone. He's the brick that's laid the foundation. So just want to let people know. Feel, you feel the know. same way about you, brother, but I want to talk about somebody else. Um, and, sir, we honor your service. And yes. one of the great things about uh, our country is we have great men like you that protect our freedoms. And so we thank you for your service. And a personal friend of mine, somebody – who uh, I consider my brother, uh, we're, we're joined today. And um, his name is uh, Sean Johnson. And Sean, who's over here, Sean, come on out here. I'm embarrassing him right now. But a lot of people don't know, people have heard about the Navy SEALs and you know the elite warriors of this country. But a lot of people don't know that less than 2% of the Navy SEALs are African American. Uh, so, Sean is a Navy SEAL and has served his country with great honor. But the story gets better. He's also the first African American uh, to uh, go from active duty Navy SEALs to become a medical doctor. So this is Dr. Sean Johnson. And, uh, but he's one of my heroes. And a, and a great guy. I'm sorry for him. He's probably going to kick my you-know-what after this uh, for embarrassing. But, but anyway, let's give him a big hand. And, uh, <laughs> again, thanks, Kev. And uh, much respect to everybody here and for all you do. And again, thanks for you guys. And please go to some of these booths, some of these employers, because there are jobs and internships to be had. That's why they're here. Thank you, guys. Again.